I am proud to present to you the very final episode of the Pokemon Black 2 Shiny Badge Quest Nuzlocke. As sad as it sounds, I need to keep my composure to round up the last fights of this episode this Nuzlocke has to offer. It's a very bittersweet feeling, but let's keep moving. After becoming the champion of the Unova region, we arrive back in Nuvema Town. Our mom and Professor Cedric Juniper say hi, and as we leave the house, Hugh and his sister thank us for getting the cat bag. The first order of business is setting up for the next hunt. As mentioned in our last episode, we will be getting one new shiny member for each episode, so this will be our final member. All we have to do is do the Funfest mission, Forgotten Lost Items, which is only available in the post-game of Black 2. This mission allows us to acquire five cover fossils, which take a little bit of time to get, but ultimately we scoop them all up. Now that we have all the stuff we need for the next hunt, we can explore new areas since we became champion. Because we're ready for the next shiny hunt, we start heading southeast through Castelia City. It's there that we find ourselves crossing Sky Arrow Bridge, long time no see. We now take the time to carefully maneuver around some trainers in the inner pinwheel forest. Passing by Charon, we then have to fight a couple of twins. These twins just had a pair of plus on mining, so I lead with East Girl and Crocs to ensure the double KO with Earthquake on the very first turn. This reminded me of the very large level difference I now need to overcome, since this new area has lots of Pokemon over level 60. Entering into Nacreen City, we take time to get ready to hunt for our 10th member, Tutuga. We eventually found Tutuga after a humble 11,155 Tutuga scene. Using the Pokedex method and seeing 5 fossils per reset proved to be pretty quick. With a rash nature, Tutuga will prove to have a very high special attack stat, but it'll need to do some solid EV investment to make sure its special defense doesn't fall off. Let's take a look at the stats, however. 26 in HP, 2 in attack, 20 in defense, 3 in its boosted special attack, 4 in its lowered special defense, and 3 in speed. Not the most impressive, but I think it'll be okay. This episode I also want to take time to look at Vanillish's EVs. 31 in HP, 8 in its boosted attack, 24 in defense, 16 in its lowered special attack, 28 in special defense, and 16 in speed. A very concerning special attack for our ice cream cone, but I'm sure we'll make it useful. Just wait. A pivotal moment in this Nuzlocke is about to take place. I decided that I would approach the Elite Four a little bit differently this time around, now that I'll be doing a rematch with all of the members. To make a fair showing of all my team members, I decided to choose the six most underutilized team members up to this point to bring with me to the Elite Four. This would most certainly ramp up the difficulty, especially losing some of my more powerful team members during the selection process. However, I want to give all my shinies a chance to, well, shine. This decision would cause me to pursue some of the best TMs up for grabs, and it starts in the PWT, the Pokemon World Tournament. After teaching Outrage to Chop Chop through the Move Tutor in Necreen, because I saw Worcester do something similar in the Pokemon Y2 any percent complete PWT run, we're ready to go. This PWT run would have the highest stakes in the run so far. Even though my Pokemon get to keep their moves and items, every Pokemon is scaled down to level 25. This means I don't ever get to have a level advantage, ensuring battles would be super risky. With 5 BP to go, on the first run I decide to use Chop Chop, Boneless, and Baconers. They cover a lot of types between the three of them, and offer safety and setup moves and healing moves too. We start by fighting Trainer Jocelyn, who has a fearsome sock with counter and sturdy. We two shot out with Bulldoze. Next, Girder takes the field, so we take the opportunity to set up as Atlanta crit rock slide. Outrage seals the deal. As Nosepass comes out, Outrage breaks its sturdy, and the Lumberry I have equipped cancels out Nosepass's Thunder Wave, and we take the clean kill. Next, Roxy's up to bat. Her team isn't the most threatening, but we still have to be cautious. A rivalry boosted Outrage starts our battle off good, one hit KOing Skolipede. Next, Golbat comes out, but since it's a female, it barely hangs on. We lose the berry, but take it out. Finally, Garbodor emerges, so Outrage does a neat chunk before we get confused with from another 2 round Outrage. Boneless takes the field against a boosted up pile of trash, but she picks it apart without too much difficulty. For the very end of the first tournament, we face Elisa. I figured this battle wouldn't be too bad, especially starting out with a male Zebstrika. I boost up with Chop Chop as it sets up a charge, but then we take it out with a follow up Outrage. Next, Flappy comes out, which doesn't stand a chance. We finish the first round with a clean out speed and kill of the Galvangela in the last spot. A solid first tournament with 4 BP left to go. We start the next tournament off in a similar fashion. Trainer Jocelyn is the first victim, so we once again break the sturdy before taking it out with Outrage. Next, a female girder lives the Outrage and drops our speed, forcing us to switch. Boneless is able to outstall the incoming Heracross with a few iron defenses and nasty plots, walling the bug out. The next battle is against Berg, which is a seemingly easy fight. I initially consider setting up with Baconers, but I opt to go plus 6 with Sword Stance to prepare for the backline. After Livani removes my rivalry ability, we take it out with an Outrage. 
Thankfully, two Escavalier are waiting in the back, which are both easily outsped and overpowered with our Dancing Dragon. To ramp up this tournament, our last opponent is Clay. His Excadrill lead is particularly intimidating, especially as a female, so our sexist Chop Chop takes half of his health as Excadrill tries to set up. We thankfully take the kill next turn. Out comes Clay Dolt, which is essentially walled by Boneless, so Chop Chop packs it up and we give Clay the bird. After some stalling through Rock Tombs by setting up Iron Defenses and Nasty Plots while healing with Roost, we take it out with a Dark Pulse. Finally, our speedy Boneless wrecks the Palpatoad in the back without too much trouble, so 3 PP to go. Starting us off in tournament number 3 is Trainer Makina. She leads with Tortuga, but since it's not our turtle, we let it faint. A couple of super effective chops does the trick. Volby comes out, which we dance and walk all over with with Outrage. Finally, the semi seer in the back tries to double team on my dragon, but we hit the Outrage and the monkey goes down. Berg is back next, so we basically just rinse and repeat. We set up, get the ability change, and take out Levani. Crustle comes out, and with a coin flip to be sturdy, we win it and it gets Oko'd. A final crusty bug comes out, but this one unfortunately is sturdy, so we tank a hit before squishing it. To wrap it all up, Elisa is in the back with the thunder. For this round, a female zebra comes out first, so I opt to take it out swiftly instead of setting up. Next, Galvantula comes out. This Galvantula has a nerve, is a female, and survives an outrage, so when it paralyzes me, I think I might be in trouble. I start off by setting up Bonus, which tanks a bug bite and outspeeds to finish the bug. However, Emolga comes out last, which has a solid type advantage against me. I whittle it down with a couple of dark pulses, but it sets up a screen and paralyzes my bird. This calls for Baconers, so we send out the big pig and it also gets paralyzed. In a battle against the odds, we shoot our shot and land a flamethrower to wrap up a super scary fight. 2 BP left. After being a bit spooked by Elisa, I swap up the team and put Electros in for Embor. This offers a bit more security and slow vault switch. To start off our first battle, Trainer Lavina leads with Lopunny. Without feeling too intimidated, Chop Chop goes on a spree and single-handedly deletes the local bunny, bird, and deer populations. Savage. Our next battle is against Clay again, who leads with Excadrill. I start with Bulldoze, but since it bulldozes in return, I now have to play a bit safe. I take the Bulldoze kill as Croc Rock comes out next. Boneless is the answer, so I start the setup as Croc tries to put a dent in my apparently weak armor. As the Croc faints, Palpato puts up a futile effort in the back end, allowing Boneless to seal it. Another final round approaches, this time Roxy is back. We see the male Scolipede lead and take the opportunity to outrage. The bug falls but not without using up our barrier with poison point first. The bat is out next, it's going to be a dark night for him. Finally the trash comes out and outrage thankfully 3 turns and chips it. We take a crit sludge in return so I know it's time to switch. We bring in Birdo and Boneless closes the deal. One more tourney left. The final tourney begins against Trainer Lavina again, so I already knew the plan. I set up a Chop Chop, tank a Dizzy Punch, and get to Outrage, and you know the deal at this point. With just a couple battles to go, I face Charon for the first time. Stalin is a coin flip to have Intimidate, and thankfully it doesn't, and it's male, so Chop Chop does what he does best, and one shots. Next up is Watchhog, which meets a similar fate. The final Watchhog is female, however, so we kick it to ensure the kill. The very final battle is once again versus Elisa. The lead Zeb Striker was fortunately male again, so I take the opportunity to one-shot the lead. I let Outrage handle Chop Chop's business, and the male Galvantula that comes out also gets obliterated. Finally, in a painfully anticlimactic fashion, the final Pokemon, a male Amalga, faints to Outrage. It's still my favorite though, sorry Squirrel. And with that, the hardest task to prepare for the Elite Four is complete. We purchased the Protect TM for 6 BP, a fair price for such a good move. Our next objective is to explore a little bit more. I make my way to Nimbasa City and start to head east. We are now granted access to the Marvelous Bridge and past it Route 15. After defeating a couple optional trainers and traversing around some ledges and the strength boulders, we pick up the powerful TM in Earthquake. Next thing we gotta do is grab the Substitute TM. Since it's all the way in Twist Mountain, we got a ways to go. I head west from Opelucid City and make it to Asira City, beating a few trainers along the way. Once we reach the new city, we immediately trade all of the rocks in our bag for some cold hard cash, which I spend about 30 minutes doing. Eventually I get rid of my rocks, and I start training up my team a bit to get ready for the trainers that guard the substitute TM. After traversing through the mountain for a bit, I eventually find the trainer guarding the TM, Veteran Chloris. She boasts three powerful Pokemon in a rotation battle, Kangaskhan, Archeops, and Gyarados. For the first turn, I hope to Volt Switch a flying type, but instead I get some chip on the Kangaskhan. I send in Chop Chop to absorb the hit, which happens to be Outrage. After tanking it, I send a low kick since it's locked in. I have to eat another Outrage, but we take the KO in the next turn. 
With only the flyers left, I try to set up defensively with Boneless, but Archeops comes around and nearly takes us out with the Stone Edge. On my back foot, I weigh my options, regretting having Gimme Kissy out at all. I decide that Chop Chop is going to have to be the hero. I swivel around and Archeops stays, allowing Chop Chop to take it out, but at the price of locking myself into Outrage. Gyarados is up next, so I just have to hope I don't get set up on or one shot. Thankfully, I land a crit outrage, taking out the vet and scoring myself the substitute TM. After making my way through the rest of the mountain, I began the trek to the final grind spot. Starting from Nacreen City, I went all the way through Route 3, Striden City, Route 2, Accumula Town, and then I made it to Route 1. On Route 1, I'm able to start the final grind for experience on all of my members. This includes using Exploring Power 3 and XP Point Power 3 to make sure I'm getting the most out of my Autonos. Eventually, I would level up to the point that Vanillas was able to evolve. It is one of the more subtle shinies for sure, but I do like it a lot. Nice. And then, not too long after, Tutuga also got his chance to get a little bigger. The shell expands and our tier 2 go emerges as a massive Karakosta. A lot of people say this shiny is worse than tier 2 go, and I can't blame them, but the shell does look nice. Karakosta would then learn shell smash along the grind. Soon enough, and I mean about a half hour later, I got enough experience to move on to the next phase of the grind, special defense EVs. Gotharina gives 2 special defense EVs per feint, so I was able to load up on both Icy Girl and Karakosta with a ton of EVs before going back to finish the level grind. After a few hours of grinding, which I was totally okay with, I eventually was ready for the final preparations before heading into the league. I taught Protect and Substitute to most members of my team, with some exceptions. I then removed their HMs and free up some more move slots. Finally, I head to Humala City to go to the Move Tutor. This old guy lets me teach Roost to E-Squirrel, a pretty important move for our flying mouse. I used the remainder of my savings to go to Shopping Mall 9 and purchase a bunch of EV buffing medicine, because I'll be needing to change things up partway through the Elite Four. With just some final finishing touches to go, I remembered to nickname Caracosta. I vouch for the nickname God Dad Agua, cause you know, he got that wet wit, that water, yeah. Finally, I teach EQ to God Dad Agua for a powerful high base power attacking move, which will prove pretty useful in an upcoming fight. With almost all the moves prepared and ready to go, I can reveal the movesets and the final Pokemon I'm going to be bringing with me to this Pokemon League rematch. Slide in DMs with Crunch, Protect, Thunder Wave, and a free spot. Icy Girl with Blizzard, Hail, Substitute, and Protect. Got that Agua with Shell Smash, Earthquake, Crunch, and Substitute. Baconers with Flame Charge, Flare Blitz, Arm Thrust, and Workup. E Squirrel with Roost, Substitute, Protect, and Encore. And Gimme Kissy with Protect, U Turn, Substitute, and Bug Buzz. As you can probably tell, I'm leaving behind some of my best members Crocs, Boneless, Chop Chop, and the Hazard Setter Rock Champ. This time around, I limited my options and made sure I'm in for a challenge. I could have stopped an episode ago, but the Elite Four and Champion fights are much more difficult now. Taking the easy route is out of the question, and a proper ending is what this team deserves. I hope you're ready. It's about to get serious. The first battle we opt to fight is against Caitlyn herself. She once again leads with the Musharna, and we start off with Vanillax. Icy Girl is only here for some quick XP though, so we toss in slide in DMs as Musharna gets a yawn off. With one turn before I fall asleep, I opt to Thunder Wave Musharna, paralyzing it. However, Musharna Synchronize takes effect and I get paralyzed in return. The last curveball is my Lumberry. Healing off the paralysis, I then get put to sleep. Why would I want to be asleep, you might ask? After switching in Gatad Agua, Musharna will always use Dream Eater instead of Charge Beam, crucial for Gatad Agua's survivability. Since Musharna got a reflect off though, we have some turns to waste. Shell Smash is the key here, so after getting a substitute up and Musharna's yawns start to fail, our plan starts to piece together. Musharna gets paralyzed a couple of times, but after two smashes, our attack and speed are both plus four and reflect wears off. It's time for some turtle action. Crunch easily puts Musharna away and Gallade comes out next. 
Without any priority moves to break my sub, a crunch does the trick. Next, Reuniclus comes out. Wanting to be up to plus 6 in attack, I decide that Reuniclus is the best Pokemon to set up on from Caitlyn's team. I Shell Smash and Reuniclus hits a Focus Blast. From here, I definitely should have just continued the sweep, but I try and get a sub back up since two of Reuniclus's moves can both miss me. I sub, but Psychic negates it. I try one last time to get a substitute up, and thankfully, Reuniclus misses the Thunder. We take it out with a Crunch. Metagross is next, and it has Bullet Punch. I wanted to always have a sub and be plus 6 in this position, so I'm glad it worked out this way. Earthquake does the trick, and we take another kill. Our Lucky Egg is putting in a ton of work too, already getting us to level 76. Gothitelle is next, which also can't handle the crunch from the turtle. It falls. Finally, Sigilyph in the back is actually outsped by her prehistoric beast, and a crunch does it in. Some risky strats paid off, and we finish the fight at level 77. With the tricky first fight, I learned the value of patience and make sure to be careful for my next battle. However, I clearly wasn't careful enough, as I forgot to teach the Surf TM to Goddad Agua. This could prove scary later on in this upcoming fight. Let's get spooky. Chantal is next, and I have a pretty solid plan for this fight. I lead with Slide and DMs, which begins the fight by paralyzing the leading Kofagrigus. I then protect for the following turns, getting rid of some Shadow Ball and will o -Wisp PP. After stalling for a bit more, I eventually get to the point where I run out of Protect PP, so I switch Icy Girl in on a Will-O-Wisp. It's a bummer that I got burned, because I was planning on using Icy Girl to stall. As our Ice Cream melts, East Girls are back up, so I switch it in on a Shadow Ball. All that's left to do now is to get rid of Kofagrigus' PP. A grueling 50 plus turns later, I finally come to a stopping point in the PP stall. Along the way, the PP ups I applied to East Girl really came in handy, allowing the PP stall to go on for a super long time. On the final energy ball, I switch in to Gimme Kissy, eating the damage. I protect the following turn to confirm struggle, and switch in Got That Agua promptly. With the coffin on a timer, I make sure to execute my moves efficiently, setting up a substitute first. A clutch paralysis comes in next, basically ensuring that I'll be able to set up safely. After a full restore comes through, and I set up the plus 6 attack at speed, I put Kofagrigus 6 feet harder. Chandelure comes out next, and my heart sinks. I totally forgot to teach Surf, and I have to risk Flame Body with Crunch. I nervously click it, and... Yep, things are gonna get scary now. Driftlum comes out next, and I Crunch, which thankfully one-shots. Golurk follows, so I Crunch again, but it just barely hangs on. A hammer arm breaks my sub, and I'm officially vulnerable. A second crunch takes out Golurk, but Chantel still has two Pokemon left. Miss Magius follows up next, and since it's less tanky than Golurk, I crunch it again to take it out. Finally, Frostlass is the last Mon, which unfortunately has Ice Shard. I can't risk it, so I switch into Bankiners, hoping to gain some traction. To my horror, Shadow Ball comes out from Frostlass. With a less than healthy pig, I click Flame Charge to beef up my speed. Psychic is Frostlass's move of choice, and a non-crit takes me all the way down to the low yellow. I eat my berry, which puts me out of blaze and flame charge isn't enough to take out the icy ghost. With my starter on the line, and considering the various options at hand, I decide the Baconers is gonna have to clutch up. Mustering up his piggy power, I click flame charge. An absolute W for the pork pals in the chat. A terrible plan gone wrong. This fight was absolutely clutched up. I'm glad Baconers had it in him to save the fight. I remembered to teach Surf to Got That Agua after the dust settles. We're only halfway done with the Elite Four and I'm already making mistakes and risking deaths left and right. It's time to stop this trend. I've come way too far to throw. With two more Heavenly Kings to go, we jump right into the next boss fight. Grimsley isn't as threatening as the other three, but I still have to try to get past him. I lead with slide in DMs, again trying to gain some traction with Thunder Wave Paralysis strats. We switch in E-Squirrel next, as Leopard Sucker Punches the air. We take advantage of this by using Encore, locking a cat into Sucker Punch. Next, Caracosta comes out. For the free couple turns thanks to Encore, we get a sub up. Next, it's just a simple Shell Smash to set up the sweep. As I try to surf Leopard at plus 6, I fortunately get immobilized because of Attract and safely set up another sub on the next turn. After that, I finally get the cat wet with the water. Scrafty comes out next. This all seems a bit too familiar. Scrafty falls to surf. Crocodile emerges next. The turtle do like to go swimming though. Houndoom comes out. 
Turtle takes another bath. Hamdu wants the heat, but all he does is get that wet wet. Finally, Bisharp is in the back, but the turtle don't play that game. A clean sweep from God Dad Agua, and we didn't have to risk a thing. Just one more left. I put this one off to maximize the turtle's EXP gains. This battle could prove to be tough, and the margins are pretty thin. Let's see what we can manage. Icy Girl is the answer, and she's going to be the main way I plan to gain an advantage over Marshall in this fight. Her protect and substitute combo allows her to tank massive damage from the leading throw, so I attempt to stall as much as I can. Eventually, Throw loses the PP for all of its superpowers, stone edges, and paybacks. Icy Girl kinda slayed. Slide and DMs is our next stop, and since Throw just has Earthquake left, I eat up as much PP as I can with the eel before sending in Got That Agua. At this point, it's just a struggle setup again. I get my sub up and get to smashing. I have to make sure to get up a sub at the end of this matchup though. After I get my third shell smash in, I take out the throw. Medicham follows, but without any priority moves and being outsped, the turtle takes control. Next, me and Shao comes out, but it can't deal with the surf sauce. It falls. Next, Sock comes out, which is the reason why we have a sub setup. Sock lives on sturdy as we get a surf off, and its close combat breaks our sub. Thankfully, the next surf seals the deal. Conkildur comes out next. With such a great level advantage, we surf it and it does enough damage. Finally, Lucario is the last mod on the field. At level 81, and with some monstrous special attack and speed stats, got that out what does in the Fighting Master. All I gotta say, is clean. We put the Elite Four past us for the final time. But we actually have a small bit of prep to do before this final battle. Gatadagua is in need of some attack buffs, so I begin to lower its special defense IVs in return for some muscle wings. Going to the champion's room, there was a different vibe this time around. I felt the excitement and build up, but I knew this was going to be the last time I felt this way. I guess that's just how Nuzlocke's work. Just let it sink in and be in the moment. Let's do this, Iris. For the final fight of the Nuzlocke, I try to craft the safest and least risky plan, and following the same path as the Elite Four battles, I will be PP stalling Hydragon. Yes, PP stalling Hydragon. To start off, Gimme Kissy has to get rid of Hydragon's Fire Blast PP, so we use Protect and Substitute until Fire Blast is gone. Finally, I can safely switch to Icy Girl. Somehow though, on the switch, Hydragon uses Focus Blast. To my amazement and luck, I dodge what could have killed me with crit. I have no clue how Iris thought that Focus Blasting and Excel Gore was a good idea. With Icy Girl out, I can finally start the stall. With incredible special defense and HP, I can perform a full stall using Protect and Substitute. Eventually, I would get it down to zero, and I send out slide and DMs to make sure it was finished. I took a struggle unnecessarily, but then it was time for Got That Agua to let the floodgates loose again. This is where extra attack EVs come in handy, allowing me to utilize both strength and surf to take Iris down. After shell smashing up, we can safely strength for the KO. To follow up, Lapras comes out. Iris's Lapras is particularly bulky, but with the level advantage, a Sylph Scarf, the attack EVs, the attack boosts, and a good plan, it's enough to one-shot it. Agron is the next victim, which is easily finished by a Surf. With just two mons to go, her ace Haxorus emerges. With the Focus Sash, we have to hit it twice to ensure the KO. The fourth strength knocks it back, and after breaking our sub, the second strength puts the ace to shame. Last but not least, the foe fossil meets us and we show it who really aged. A well-planned and well-executed victory. At a final time of 491 hours and 9 minutes, we enter the champion team into the Hall of Fame after beating the new and improved Elite Four and Iris. And just like that, we get to the credits after a very eventful slew of battles. I did most of my reflecting in the previous episode, but I do have one main shoutout to give. 
I never properly covered Got Dead Agua and his contribution to the Nuzlocke. Making a fine last member, it absolutely brought the drip to the Elite Four round two, and Ice Girl made a great team with him. An average amount of fossils seen for an amazing wet boy. Wouldn't trade him for the world. And, with plushie in hand, I had some life thoughts I wanted to throw out there as well. This game is really special to me. It's my first Pokemon game ever, and going through it again was, like, a joy. Um, and I treasure it. I don't think I'm ever going to have a playthrough like this again, so... Uh, with that said, thank you for watching. Thank you for following along this incredible journey. And I'll see you in the next video. Peace out. That just about does it, again. I want to upload a proper conclusion video for this series, but since it finished first, get ready for the last few episodes of the Pokemon White Shiny Bash Quest Nuzlocke, my partner series that aims to Nuzlocke Pokemon White. I'll have it linked in the description. Thank you for watching.